Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 101. My name is Mark. Here with me today is Bubba. Hola. And Matt. My triumphal return. <laughs> We've not been on the podcast in a while. I can't remember. Uh, yeah, it's been a while. Once or twice in the last. while. And we are here to talk about sports. Sports. Be good at them. More specifically, <laughs> talking about sports as game design, because obviously sports are games and they are designed. Uh, so the reason I'm bringing this up is partially because baseball is back on. And so I'm excited about sports. The weather's nice. I've been playing disc golf and watching the Cardinals. And that's, you know, greatly inspiring. Uh, but also because I've been wanting to talk about this specifically for a long time, because I think there's lots of fascinating things in sports game design that relate somewhat to board games, but also are separate from, from the kinds of considerations in board game design. And I want to dive into that. So what we're going to do, we're going to talk about some broad ideas and then go into some interesting either rules that exist in various sports or rules we think should exist or maybe should not exist but are currently being debated in various sports leagues. And I think the most interesting question when we're talking about these different rules is what are we aiming for? And I think that question is a whole lot more complex when it comes to professional sports than it does with board games. With board games, because especially hobbyist board games, right, the goal is usually by the designer to make a great game by whatever estimation, you know, what, what kinds of mechanisms and feelings and emotions and styles they enjoy playing and they think are awesome. And then to some degree... The goal is to sell games. They make a game that's appealing to people that get bought off the shelves. And that's basically it. You know, maybe there's some other considerations here and there, but it's pretty straightforward. In sports, you have lots and lots of different people who are very interested, uh, both, you know, personally and financially, to the sum of billions of dollars. And they all have different ideas of what should happen with sports so anyways that's the framing i want to bring uh forward in uh, as we consider these ideas before we start into like the sport sphere really quickly staying on board games what do you guys think is the board game that most from a viewership perspective relates to sports like to, to me chess immediately pops to the top of my mind just because of the increased viewership it's had over the past few years, just mm -hmm. online even. Um, but I don't know if, can you, can you think of any other board games that are to that extent? Like potentially, or that actually have either. either. I, don't, I don't know if there's any, I mean, in terms of board games that get some amount of media attention, you know, even though it's the odd article every once in a while in terms of competitiveness, you got chess, you've got go, you've got scrabble. I don't know if there's much else. Yeah, I mean, you could you could throw magic. Oh, poker. Obviously, oh, poker. Ma yeah, magic's a good one too. Magic, yeah, yeah. I that's that's an Poker's interesting probably, case. Probably in terms of actual attention, it's probably poker than chess, and then yeah. a lot of other things. Yeah, has poker waned in in attention? I assume so. I, like I know Bob, ESPN doesn't yeah. cast it as much as it, they used to. I was going to say, they you still have, every now and then. What we still ESPN like... number is poker on? Back in, in the heyday, it was like <laughs> a constant on ESPN two. <laughs> it, it's it's still there occasionally, it, certainly not as much as it used to be. In a lot of ways, over the last three or four years, Magic tried and failed to kind of capture the sports feeling. I mean, and, and maybe it's just that Wizard didn't. Wizards of the Coast didn't really capitalize on the esports thing. It is interesting when when you have like the sports idea of different people have different things that they want out of the experience. Sometimes you end up with a, like worse in all regards. And, and oh, I, sure. I, I I think I think Magic kind of did that, and now they're kind of ditching their esports thing. That's but, interesting. Yeah, because yeah. Hearthstone did pretty well, and I think continues to do all right in terms of media. Uh, broadcasts professional professionalized competitive stuff but hearthstone is a substantially simpler game than magic is i think it naturally tends to be easier to get into from a viewer perspective 
when that came to mind, I was just thinking about like just all the variations of chess too, just with like, whether it be your full blown game, your time game, your bullet chess, what have you. Mm -hmm. And just like what that does to viewership and, and how easy that is or difficult that is to take in a game. Yeah. And I think in terms of board games, getting like competitive televised or streamed or whatever coverage, there aren't that many interesting games that would make for good viewing. Well, you like, also just have, why... you have to have global acceptance too. Like yeah, everybody, everybody knows the rules, at least the baseline rules of baseball. Everybody knows the baseline rules of chess. Like, you know, the general objective, you got to kill the king. Not everybody knows the baseline rules of settlers of Catan or yeah. whatever other board game that you're you, you you want to try to start a competitive scene in. Yeah. Well, so you, if you were your, trying your goal, to do that, you would have to put in a lot of work on comprehension for the, a lot of board games you. have much more abstracted goals. Like even if it's victory points, right? Mm -hmm. It's still way more abstract, and, and if you don't understand the whole picture, then you're not going to enjoy the, the viewing. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. And that's where sports come in nicely. Yeah. So you, you're watching a, a, a person play golf. You know that the goal is to get the ball in the hole. <laughs> you don't know easy. the goal, right? It's because it's a crowd activity, right? If you have literally no clue, you can kind of just go with the flow of like when people get excited or when people seem to be angry or happy on the field, right? Even if you're literally clueless, you could still kind of follow, you at least follow the flow, I mean, the emotional flow out, of the game. Out of experience, I've watched football with a lot of people that have no idea the rules of football, but the emotional flow is, is very effective. I think that's, yeah. that's very true. That'd be hard to capture with a board game. That's, you know, discreet. It's not continuous. All right, let's let's get to then our first idea, which, which is one Matt brought up, which I find absolutely fascinating, and I don't know why it doesn't exist currently in every applicable sports league because it makes complete sense. But I'll let Matt describe it. Describe uh, gold drafting. Yeah, so gold drafting. The, the basic idea of gold drafting is that in in sports where after one season, you're going to play another season and there's an entry draft for players where you select players for your team. That draft is typically decided by the worst team, usually determined by, by re record or something like that, maybe with a lottery system to introduce some randomness. Goal drafting says the team that wins the most points at the end of the year drafts first. But you only start collecting points when you are eliminated from playoff contention. So the, the, the basic goal of this would be to incentivize teams to win at all times. Uh, while you still have a chance to make the playoffs, you very much want to win. Uh, when you can't make the playoffs, you want to win as many gold points as you can uh, to position yourself for the future uh, the best. Yeah. So. And it's a great idea, especially, I think, for the NFL, because in football, maybe more than any other sport, you see teams deliberately trying to lose games. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting, because I know this from hockey, because there's some hockey people that <laughs> talk about it a lot. But I, I think NFL is what I thought of, of as well. And in a condensed season of 16 games, I think that the excitement that goal drafting would generate for mediocre teams at the end of the season um, would be a huge payoff, right? Yeah. I Those last so. couple of games of the season where you just want to lose. <laughs> I mean, the, the Jets would have something to play for. And when you're talking about like, a, yeah, a 16 game season, like that, that could, that would be awesome. You could have the Jets playing for the first pick against a team that's playing for their playoff spot at all. Like how, yeah. how, how cool would that be? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think NFL would definitely be the best league to adapt something like this. I don't know what you would do for the teams that are on the bubble. Like, how, how do you because because you typically in an NFL season you, you have quite a few teams even in the last week that still have a chance, quote unquote, to make the playoffs and aren't technically eliminated. 
I feel like this rule would only really be applicable to like eight teams a season at most. That's true. I don't know what the tie yeah, but, would be, which is still fine. Like, yeah, honestly, but it's, that's it's, those those top eight picks are the picks that people really really care about. Yeah, um, yeah, and yeah, especially in the NFL. You some seasons like there's a huge difference between picks like two and three, right? Absolutely. There's might absolutely. be like two top tier quarterbacks, and then you know if you're a team, typically if you're a really bad team, you need a quarterback because it's by far the most important position, and so. Being in one of those top two could be so important for you. I don't think it's that different than current systems because you still have that middle of the pack soup. You know, you, I mean, you have a normal distribution of, of yeah, and, outcomes. And, and I'm not saying that like it doesn't disincentivize the, that middle of the pack soup to not win. Like it certainly they still want to win to try to make the playoffs. I, I'm more like, how do you at at that point? How do you rank those teams that have not yeah. made the playoffs? I don't think yeah, it matters I don't think that it, much. Well, I don't think it's I, a, I think any it, different. To the point where I think you could just have a, a lottery within ties. Well, no, you can you could still have the same tiebreakers that you have now. I mean, head to head, you know, uh, all the same tiebreakers that you have now still incentivize good play. And you only start collecting gold points after you're eliminated. So if you go into week 16 with a chance to make the playoffs, you're pl- you're incentivized to make the playoffs. That's what you're playing for. We got to talk about this. The follow up idea is: Do you only allow mathematical elimination to be the to be the point where you start collecting gold points, or do you introduce <laughs> some sort of like um, nightly waiver wire where teams can declare themselves out of the playoff race and in the gold race? <laughs> No, you do not. Why not? Certainly not not? in the NFL. So, no. So, if if you did that, wouldn't you just introduce tanking at the beginning of the season? (laughs) No, because I think I think there the social pressures from the fans would not allow tanking. Right? Even even NFL teams that tank now, they don't start tanking till a good chunk of the season is through. Here's where I I think I don't maybe think you see teams tanking in play they may tank yeah. in terms of like not signing people right to leave cap space open or something yeah. that's yeah. that's a different thing i don't think you see yeah. teams tanking in play by not you know playing aggressively or playing you know testing out different players at different positions not necessarily optimizing for the win right now i don't think you see that till week eight nine ten in the nfl i think it might be um more of an interesting idea for leagues like the nba nhl where you have these long seasons where you know any analytics model would give a team a 0.5% chance of making the playoffs and you know at that point why not let them start playing for something i kind of alternatively i think you combo especially for for hockey and basketball you combo this with having fewer playoff teams <laughs> Oh, don't get me started on that. I hate the direction we're going in yeah. all these leagues. Hockey and basketball have and baseball way now too. too many playoff teams. Baseball now too, Mark. Yeah. What are they doing now? Did they change something for this year? Well, the the league wanted uh, sixteen teams in the playoffs, and then the ah. the players the players collectively bargained down to fourteen. But it's going to expand. I don't see any reason to ever have more than the top 40 percent and i'm being generous there making the playoffs i totally agree with you but i think somewhere between 25 and 40 percent is probably the good sweet spot for any playoff situation but i think obviously the reason they do that is because they want local viewership invested throughout the season you kind of solve that with the gold point thing not not completely obviously but you solve that partially so now you have a reason to shrink the playoffs back down. So th- I, I think that would be the ideal situation, I, but I don't think you just, let, allow people to bow out early. What, what gets me is the, the NBA complaining about their stars, not playing in regular season games and them letting teams with four fifty records into the playoffs. <laughs> like that's ridiculous. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm with you guys on this. And then, but then, of course, in this whole discussion, we had to analyze what are we 
designing this for? What are our right. priorities here, right? Because the reason, think, again, the, that they're expanding it, I assume, is to try to get viewership by making more teams, you know, playing for something real more often. I think what you want, what we want to optimize for is incentives aligned with winning. And and that's what makes exciting games mm-hmm. naturally. Yeah, but like Bubba, like you said, quantity of games Specifically quantity playoff games. Because that's that's the money maker. Yeah. Like just yeah. C- coming from a uh, from an, a network point of view, like playoff game one, even if it's one versus eight seed, eight's gonna get more views than your yeah. regular yeah. season game between the same two teams. Yeah. Like, that's just how it is. And that's where all the network money is made. Yeah. I think you get diminishing returns at some point. You have to. You have to get diminishing returns on that where you sacrifice the integrity of the playoffs as a whole for those single game you know, bumps. At some point, it becomes less profitable in the long run. We've got a lot of non-league stuff we want to talk about, but like, there's a whole different set of systems in Europe that I think are really interesting. I don't I was really just about know, to talk about, but just it's about just to mention like, promotion and was promotion, it promotion and relegation. And relegation yeah. I think it's a fantastic <laughs> system. Oh, it's great. Like what a fantastic system of, of, of incentives, I think. And I've always wanted to see something like that in a board game. And it, I, I don't have any ideas of where it would fit in, but like just, just that mechanism of having diff- different like bands and, the top in each band get bumped up, the lowest get bumped down. Do either um, of you? I don't think I, neither of you follow Premier League at all, do you? No, not only really. in the most distant sense. If I see a yeah, headline, so, I may click on it. Yeah. So next weekend is the big, what they call? I think they call it the the ten million dollar game or something like that. It's the English Championship playoff, but they do uh, the rank three to rank six teams all are in a playoff and they just had the semifinals this past weekend. Next weekend is the big final. And I believe it's between Nottingham forest who I'm a big fan of. And I want to say Sheffield United, but I don't remember, (laughs) but yeah, they're playing for a spot in the premier league. And it's literally like millions upon millions of dollars just for the one game. It's something special. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. I don't know. I I don't think that's a reasonable thing that would ever happen in an American league, though, because there's so much money pumped into the top that you. It's really ground up a different system, and there, yeah. there's no easy path from one to the other, or at least from our system to that system. Yeah, and there's such like you know in in England, a lot of these teams are like mid. In terms of like city size, right? You know, Sheffield's not is a large city, but it's not that big a city. Whereas in American sports, like even some major, major cities don't have pro sports teams of, you know, there's only a handful of cities that have a team in every league. Do you do you know what the biggest city by market size that doesn't have a pro sports team is? In that US? has zero pro like of the top zero of the big of four? The top top five league. Yeah. Is it Austin? Nope. This is this is not population. This is TV market size. TV market size. Yeah. I don't know. It's Hartford. Really? That's how it is. Ever since the Whalers left, it's been Hartford. Huh. Hartford, Connecticut. Interesting. Does Austin have a soccer team? Uh, uh technically Hartford has a soccer team, but it's not it's not an MLS team. Okay. Austin. What does Austin have? Uh, don't they have Texas Rangers? No, that's Arlington. That's Arlington. Oh, yeah. Maybe one of the teams that's called Texas is in Austin. I forget. Silly Texas with their state pride calling all their teams they, Texas. They have Austin FC, which is a soccer club, but I hmm. that's that's MLS. So I guess that technically counts. That would count, I suppose. Yeah. Fascinating. But yeah, I don't know. A uh, relegation thing would like... What if a New York team got relegated? Like the whole country wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Glorious. And again, bring up the Jets. Like it would happen. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. 
Like, what would you do there? It's it's. Well, in football, they, the Jets, the Jets would like have to go down to college. <laughs> college. <laughs> yeah, you don't really have a secondary uh, football league. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, unless you count the the new the upcoming XFL that's starting next year. Yeah, I mean you'd have to build out all these leagues. I mean the baseball is a minor league system, but that's training. Th- those are owned by the major teams, and it, they're they're uh, all the right. players are under contract with the major league team. They're, that's just where they play. You know, in the meantime, lots of interesting, fascinating incentives at play there. In terms of, I think gold drafting works pretty much across the board though right because when you have more games that matter it serves everyone's interest it serves the fans the players want to be playing for something like no no player who reaches a professional level wants to be in a game where it's clear their coach isn't trying really to win right or the owners you know whoever's making the decisions isn't putting them in a position to try to play to win uh the viewers want that uh, and it'll probably pull in better numbers in terms of viewership and in, in the money side of things. So, yeah, I think. And I, I think you could have more more realistic narratives as well. Like the narratives surrounding bad teams are just terrible. You know, I don't know if you guys get that. But like I, I have to I turn off the, the sound more than half the time when I'm watching sports because I, I don't want to hear whatever ridiculous narrative <laughs> is, you know. Yeah, being used for some like mediocre New York team that has a 10% chance of making the playoffs. Just tell it like it is. Let's move to more in-game rule ideas. I just want to throw one out there, just if only to recommend a video that makes the case extremely well that in f- professional football, there should no longer be a kick return after a score. Uh, it is the single dumbest play for a number of reasons, and you should all go watch John Boyce video on this i'm sure if you look up eliminate the kick return on youtube it'll be the first one to show up in short the reasoning is that it is by far the most dangerous play in football and it is also by far the least important play in football insofar as like 98.5 percent of the time the exact same thing happens but it also causes tons of injuries it's very stupid uh, and should be eliminated. It's another one of those like weird narrative things. Like, I, I don't know the amount of excitement, you know, just in the stadium, like you have the, Oh, as the, as the kick goes up in the air and comes yeah, it's down a ceremonial thing. It, it's, it's a ceremonial thing yeah. almost. Yeah. <laughs> but, but just like in baseball, it? you get rid of like playing out the intentional walk. I think you get rid of the, of the kick return, right? You don't need the ceremony. And I believe the proposed replacement is you give them a you give the team that just scored a fourth and twenty five or something, and then they just choose to punt most of the time unless they want to go for it because you got to give. I think maintaining the option of them doing something risky to get the ball back is interesting. And I think in the video, I think it's fourth and twenty five. Maybe it's fourth and thirty. Basically, it is the fourth down that gives the same odds of success as an onside kick currently. I don't like that at all. I think I think late in the game, you get way too many pass interference type plays, and it's just going to dissolve into nonsense reliance on the refs. That could be true. I don't know. I think the- I, 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 I agree that the kickoff is stupid. I love the onside kick. Yeah, I think I think you could play with the onside kick rule or just and- give them an option to attempt an onside. Like it's either yeah. the opposing team gets the ball in the twenty five, right. or they can or say, you can "Hey, try we're an going onside for kick. it." Yeah, it's like no one's play, ever. Play with the how many rules. times has a team actually been surprised by an onside kick? Like twice ever. <laughs> it happens. It happens actually quite a bit in college football, but yeah. Don't you have like the the high school story where like the team always is the onside kick? always goes for it on fourth down <laughs> and like <laughs> it actually works out in a high school level environment <laughs> that that could work yeah i mean there is there is the reality that i mean it's changed a little bit in the past few years but like statistical analysis has shown that uh nfl teams play far too conservatively to maximize points yeah. And that's another what, what, interesting thing because there's pushback against that because people don't understand how statistics work, like viewers. And so 
the counter incentive to playing optimally, right, now that we have the data to analyze that, is that fans get mad because if you try something that's perceived as risky and fail, even though it has a positive EV against the alternatives, you get people mad and then they don't buy as many tickets or, or jerseys or whatever, uh, which you start to see now in football, you start to see teams going for it more and short and fourth, short fourth downs and doing a little bit more risky things. And I think slowly it'll push towards more quote unquote rational decision making as fans get used to it, right? They're boiling the frog yeah. there. Yeah. Okay. So interestingly, in contrast, board games do such a good job of doing away with these sorts of conventions, right? Yeah. Like that's something that sports and all of the ceremony and mystique around the game, all the different levels of incentives add, add things like this. And it, and it's, it's everywhere in, in sports. For, for, but I mean, for like sure. in competitive gaming though you still have the weird social pressures of like you know if if someone discovers a quote-unquote janky deck right for magic or some other competitive game or a, an unusual strategy i think this comes up a lot in competitive fighting games like digital fighting games you know with super smash brothers someone picks a weird you know a weird character that's not considered top tier and they find some weird way to play with them there's lots of social pressure for those people to not do those things, which is a phenomenon I find bizarre. Oh, yeah, I didn't know that. Um, there's a game or there's a book rather by Serlin, David Serlin, I think. He's designed a couple of board games called, I can't remember what it's called, but he's basically because he was a competitive fighting game player and he wrote this book basically to make the argument that you should try to win. And the argument is any legal method of winning the game should be considered valid. And the fact that he actually thought that this book was necessary, I think, says a lot about that community. And he talks about like foo strategies and people get upset about foo strategies. And, you know, it goes into other things if I remember correctly. But yeah, it makes sense. If you think a particular strategy is stupid, right, maybe you can appeal to the governing committee to ban a certain card you know maybe it's you think it's overpowered or, or restricted in some way but as while it's still legal you shouldn't get mad at someone for doing something that's legal uh in terms of a strategy now i'd add on there that there's certain like sportsmanship things that people should ethically adhere to but beyond that in terms of pure strategic decision making yeah if someone wants to hit a twice instead of b twice why should you get mad at them yeah I don't know. You see this in chess a lot. Like there's there's openings in chess that and and I'm by no means a, a chess expert or nor do I really even know any of the like standard openings, but when you're watching a chess stream and someone starts with some unorthodox opening that like isn't planned out over the first six moves or what have you you get a lot of comments like just like what what is this guy doing type comments yeah um, and yeah, i think at the high along. levels though you know the, the the best players will understand i think at like a really top tier chess tournament if someone plays an unusual opening people will all understand that they're trying to do that as a like to bring an element of surprise sure yeah and i think the top players usually have a couple of secondary like most most top pros will have an opening that they're best at, but they'll also have a couple of secondary openings that they may pull out against certain players or in certain situations, or just if they don't know what to do and want to try to get a surprise, you know, the throw, throw their opponent off the, off their game. Now, that, that might be more of a fan fan thing. There's interesting social dynamics. Let's talk about the designated hitter. It is now in the national league. For those who don't know baseball, in baseball, traditionally, all the people who are in the, the field who are part of the defense uh, also bat. And it's the same players. You can have substitutions, but, you know, they got to be determined. And then once you're out of the game, you don't get to come back in. But starting in, what, the 70s? Somewhere in the 70s, I believe, the American League, which is one and a half of professional baseball, instituted the designated hitter, which says that the pitcher can 
not hit, and then you ha- just pull someone else who doesn't do any defense but just hits to replace them. And then this year, the National League has brought that on. I don't like it because I think it reduces the amount of strategy in the game of baseball. The argument against, in or rather the argument in support of the designated hitter, is that people don't like pitchers going up there and sucking at hitting. <laughs> like, like that, you know, one-ninth of the batters are just objectively bad at it. It's not fun to watch. I don't know what you guys, do you guys have opinions about the DH? So I, I used to be along the same lines of you in that I, I lament the lack of strategy, but I think there's other ways to correct it than mandating that a pitcher hits. Yeah, that, that's pretty much all I have to say about it. I, I don't mind. What do, you, what do you think are the ways, though? So, for example, what they did to the baseball this year. <laughs> oh, by making the baseball not be an explosive bomb that launches off of anything it touches? <laughs> I think that helps, <laughs> but that, that's actually another, it's not a rule change, but it's something that baseball did this year that clearly had an effect on the game. Oh yeah. Um, like you, in the first month of the season, you had a lower batting average and far less home runs in the national league than you did the last two years. And that's with the implementation of a DH this year. Yeah, which is just well, at one point it was the lowest batting average since 1968, which is the famous season that was like the pitcher season dominated by the pitcher. Yeah. The pitcher where Bob Gibson threw moved, a 1.12 ERA. They, they lowered the Cardinals mound, year, right? and then they lowered the mound. Yeah, yeah. In response, the baseball thing I think is just silly. They, they why they've been experimenting with the baseball in the top league instead of doing their data collection solely in the minor leagues and then just choosing a baseball. I have yeah. no idea. Cause was it, it is, last it, year or two years ago where there were clearly two baseballs in play? I believe that was two years. You know, last year was COVID. So I believe it was two years ago. Last year was like the juiced ball. They, they chose the hot ball two years ago. St- they figured out that like 50% of the time there was a different ball. Well, have you heard the thing with the humididors or humido? I forget. Humidors. I can't say them. Humidors. Yeah. Where, so they mandated humidors this year for okay. all teams. Where previously that, it was just Colorado. Uh, it, it was a handful of teams. I okay. think like six, six or eight teams were using them. And they discovered that it was less so the, the change in the baseball and more so the batting air, the, the specifically the lack of home runs was due to the massive number of teams adopting humidors huh um yeah interesting so they just mandated it across the board yep so i'd i'd like to admit that i don't really understand any of the strategy it, i mean is it basically that if you if you really need a key hitter when the pitcher is up you have to make the choice of take take them out for for a, a hitter yeah, I think the is two the, most common the, thing? the two most common things are, um, yeah, making that decision. The you're in a situation where there's runners on base, you have a high chance of of scoring if you get a hit, and your pitcher's coming up to bat. Do you sacrifice maybe a pitcher who's pitching well to get a better batter up, or do you leave the pitcher in and risk losing those runs? That's a fascinating yeah. decision. I also yeah. think the double switch is really cool. I don't know if anyone else in the world is a fan of the double switch, but it is what it is. Like, I don't think you're losing anything by eliminating that, though. It's almost a tactical versus strategic decision, because with allowing more people who are excellent at the at the particular part of the game that they're they're doing um, to be to be playing, you end up with more interesting plays more more exciting plays certainly uh, and then you lose that kind of the chess game the managerial stuff yeah yeah which i think baseball has a like a maybe a uniquely baseball has maybe a unique relationship with that kind of strategic level stuff in the game i think like fans understand that better than they do in other sports yeah i mean baseball is the most board gamey of the sports Largely for that reason, largely because there's discrete, there's more discrete actions rather than fluid, uh, continuous actions. 
there's more data. There's more clear statistics. Yeah, there's there's a lot more. And the fans, I think, do appreciate that a lot more than in other sports uh, across the hey, board. To answer your first question that you you presented me after after we were talking about the DH, the the way that you fix this, I think, is opening up the roster size or limiting the number of pitchers a roster can carry. And they already do that to be fair, but I'm talking either opening it up for more position players or subtracting even more pitchers off the roster, Hmm. Um, which would open you up for more substitutions for defensive specialists and pinch runners. And I think that that would open up strategy a lot. Um, the, The Braves world series roster, they rostered, a player on their world series that was not rostered the entire season in Terrence score. And he was only there to steal bases. There's there's literally the only reason he was on the roster. Yeah. And they carried 12 pitchers instead of the normal 13. And I think he, I think he did end up getting into a game once to try to steal a base. I don't remember for sure, but I I thought it was an interesting inclusion. Um, It is interesting. I don't know how well that works. Me neither. And like like, the other team knows if they pinch run this guy, he's going to try to steal, which eliminates part of the effectiveness of stealing, which is being sneaky. Yeah, but you could just be pinch running him to put a fast runner on first that can score on a double. Yeah, that's true. Uh, But fun fact, uh, I learned the other day is that Albert Pujols hasn't been caught stealing in five years. (laughs) He has like 15 steals. Wow. (laughs) Over that time. uh, (laughs) For those who don't know who that is, at least one of us in this call can run faster than Albert Pujols. (laughs) I think I could make a race competitive in a sprint with Albert Pujols. Uh, Yeah, he's not fast, but he he knows how to be sneaky. All right, let's move over to basketball. The three-point line has been the talk of NBA basketball for the last few years. Because teams have figured out statistically that there are two types of shots in basketball that have the best expected value. It is the three point shot and like the layup, like the the, the, yeah, the, dunk the, post, the post up, like within five to ten feet of the basket shot. And everything else has a significantly lower EV uh, unless your name is Michael Jordan and you're not old. And so the the number of three point shots being taken is has increased significantly. I think they should just move it back a little bit and try to balance the EVs, right? Okay, hear me out. Hear me out on this one. Continuously varying <laughs> score values. Increased decimals. <laughs> you have a three point one shot, yeah. a three point <laughs> one shot. Basketball has great tracking. <laughs> The so problem, true. the problem is with discrete breaks. When you introduce a discrete yeah. break, you introduce. You're thinking like an economist. I was gonna make the. <laughs> I was gonna make this comment that gold drafting is like the exactly the kind of thing an economist would come up with. You know, a, a non-sports <laughs> economist gets, you know, just learns about a sport and then proposes solutions. This is another kind of thing an economist <laughs> would do, and it's a terrible idea. <laughs> Uh, but I also love it. Can you can you imagine the graphics of like you're watching the NBA and they're just like varying numbers on every on everyone's heads as they move closer and further away from the basket? Oh man! <laughs> oh, you're you're saying for the whole length of the court, not even like three point yeah. beyond. Yeah, you yeah. could have a, like a yeah. point. Oh point. yeah, yeah. Definitely. Wait, is it is it player based too? Like does Steph Curry have a different continuous grid than <laughs> than whoever DeAndre? <laughs> this is my chance no, to no, be part no, of the no. NBA. Yeah, right, right. Can you imagine the number of I mean, points I could score yeah, if I made a basket that. in the NBA under that system? <laughs> Teams I'd, be would the, have entire... I'd be on the court, and there'd be, the number above my head would be yeah. like ten thousand points. <laughs> Teams would have entire strategies around getting people like you to score baskets. <laughs> I think we've looped back around to this being okay. an excellent idea. Yeah, yeah. The three-point line's got to be moving back in the next few years, right? 
Do you think that's and that's got to be under discussion at least? I don't know what they're going to do because it's another thing oh. where I think there's a solid argument that it makes the game less fun to watch. I already so so you. what exactly what exactly does it do? What what good things are incentivized when? you de incentivize three pointers like what what does that do to play that is something that we would desire it opens up the more of the court for people to take shots on because currently and i don't admittedly i don't watch a lot of nba because of the style of play the style is is basically you have someone who drives towards the basket and then either gets an opening to make a basket close or tries to find an opening to pass back out. Yeah. And so they're constantly poking, it, they're constantly trying to alternate the ball between those two spots of yeah. close to the basket or three point. And, th and then likewise, defenses are trying to minimize the chance of shooting from right under the basket and contest threes. Yeah, I, I'm not 100% on how defenses are adapting, but I think that it makes it or they're or they're doing lots of screens and stuff around the perimeter of the three point line to try to get, you know, their their best but, shooters isolated. But you're thinking that it's an inherently more interesting if the mid range shot is like an, an EV valid decision. Yeah, I think it is, right? I, I think the, the problem is it never will be, right? Because the mid range will still always be less than a layup or a dunk, EV wise. Sure, but I think there are more interesting ways. Hmm, maybe. I think there are more interesting ways to generate that kind of shot, right? You can be a center posting up. It could be dynamic passing, right? So you, if you look at like uh, the San Antonio teams of like 10 years ago, 10 to 15 years ago, uh, where they would do these very complex passing systems to generate these little layups or like 10 to 15 foot shots. Obviously, the space near the three point line, but not past the three point line will never be good. And so maybe there's an argument that if you push the three-point line back, you're just making more of that space. But I think you also get movement in terms of EV from the other direction where now maybe, you know, maybe an 18-foot jumper is now better, is now in the same position a 15-point jump or 15-foot jumper was before. I don't know. So you get yeah. movement in both, in both directions relative to the three-point line. So... I think it would improve the game. But I also think, and we were talking about this before, that basketball is the least interesting game design among the major professional sports because the penalty system encourages penalties as part of play, and which means that the game is constantly broken up with penalties. And I think it's just... And again, you could argue that it makes a lot of decision points and this makes it a more interesting game but I think aesthetically it makes it an uglier game, which is another incentive at play here is that you want the game to be not only like intellectually interesting to watch, but also aesthetically interesting to watch, uh, which is a whole nother thing. Yeah. Garbage time in, in basketball is aesthetically the worst thing in sports. Like hack a shack is the dumbest thing to watch in all of professional sports. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, like it's so boring <laughs> do, do we want to talk about golf <laughs> yeah yeah they've Dude, generally I mean, gotten rid of it though well i mean there aren't yeah. as many horrible free throw shooter like Shaq was generationally an awful free throw shooter um, I, I was thinking about this i i think i really like soccer's penalty system i think i think it, it generally Despite the whole diving thing, which has has merit that that people hate that soccer players dive. Oh, that's real bad. Um, the free kick as a reward or, or a, a punishment for doing something wrong, I think works really well because it does introduce like a, a really hot, dangerous set piece. Mm -hmm. But 
in cases where it's not going to be like a shot on goal or a you know a pass to generate a shot on goal, it 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 just kind of generates it it just quickly resets the play in an advantageous way for for the, for the team that was penalized. Yeah, there's very so little. I was thinking fuss. about that. I really yeah. I really like that. Yeah. Well, the crazy thing is, it's kind of the same thing as a basketball free throw, but a basketball three free throw is really boring and. A free kick is that what that's called? A free kick. Yep. Yeah. Uh, can be the most exciting moment of the game in soccer. Yeah, and it might just be because of the pace of the games. I mean, basketball is just up and down, up and down, up and down. So when you have a stop for a free throw, it's it's a big deal. Yeah. The other uh, the other thing about the free kick is that it it it's more naturally part of the game because you get the kick from where the, the penalty happened. Yeah, you just bring the ball back. Yeah, soccer. The great thing about soccer is that. In terms of rules, it's so minimalistic, other than offsides, it 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 looks exactly like a game that children would invent. And I mean that in the best way possible. Like the rule set is almost entirely just things that you would come up with if you were given a ball and a net and two nets and a field and were like, here, make a game. You're like, okay, we're gonna try to kick it in the goal. Or, you know, yeah, what do we do with this ball? Let's just say you can't use your hands. Okay, that's fun and interesting. You're trying to kick it in. Cool. Uh, what's not allowed? Well, you can't pummel the other person, right? You can't just like obliterate them and take the ball away. That seems legit. What else? I don't know. Not much else. <laughs> How about this <laughs> one guy? Wait, we're finding it's too easy to kick it in the goal. How about we let one guy touch it with his hands and he can he can block? Oh, that's cool. That's what the game is. <laughs> like <laughs> that's the beauty of it. It's so minimalistic compared to so many other sports. And therefore the viewing experience is is extremely fluid. Like soccer is the yeah. longest stretches yeah. of continuous play other than probably more than hockey. Um, definitely more. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely hockey more. they yep. they do the reset. <laughs> Hockey's resets like the puck drop thing, whatever the face off uh are, are pretty smooth though. It doesn't interrupt it for very long. Um, again, unlike yeah. the free throw, I think it's uh, here's an interesting distinction going off the outline. Soccer has play restarts with one team controlling the ball. Hockey restarts with a coin flip, a face off, <laughs> yeah, a coin flip. That is something that you I think you've I, told me before is that like it's more or less a coin flip with like one or two exceptions of players who are actually good at winning face-offs or something. Yeah. Yeah. The best, like the best players are like 60%. And I think, Oh, okay. That's mm, actually decent. I think like 90, um, that might be, that might even be too much. I think like 99% of centers are within two percentages of 50. <laughs> Personally, I I'm, I'm kind of, it doesn't matter in hockey because you know once the action starts, it's it's so fast and, and the action's happening. But I think I'd like a team controlling the ball or the or the, you know the puck better than the the, the face off. I don't know. <laughs> Basketball has it like at the beginning of the game, but then goes to a more team based control. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. I'd buy that. Are there any other interesting instances in sports of of, of punishment like? Uh, one, one interesting thing I think is that in hockey, the the lowest unit of punishment is actually hugely impactful to the game, and I think that introduces some really bad incentives to both players and referees. Hmm. Where do you have referees that don't actually call? <laughs> hockey is terrible for referees not calling it by the rule book. There, there was a big deal a couple years ago where referee publicly said something about game management. Everyone knows that referees manage the game more than they call the game by the by the rule book. But but it, you know it was a faux pas to actually say it out loud. I don't have a better idea, but that the the problem of the lowest unit of punishment being too impactful is a problem. Whereas soccer, as we were talking, I think does a great job of making it, you know, real punishment, but part of the flow of the game. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I, like I, I sort of, I know what you're getting at, but like, I feel like that's the reason you see flopping in soccer 
is that the punishment is actually quite harsh. Like, obviously, the flopping only occurs in the attacking area, but like a That's penalty, true. a penalty kick is is crazy. Like, a- ad- admittedly, I was I was not thinking of penalty kicks, which are the most impactful punishment. <laughs> yeah, but the solution there is just penalizing oh. flopping even more, right? Hey. Sure. Right. So if it's obvious to the refs, yeah. you have a significant in-game punishment. Or on the back end, on replay, after the game, you suspend players for games, which I don't think they do very much, right? No. I, I think like that is I, such an obvious answer. Yeah, I, I'm 100% for that. For I think... Yeah, yeah, I, I, think I mean, and that goes into VAR. Like, if you're going to use it for in-game assessments then why not look at post-game suspensions for i think a lot of the all sorts of different i things. think baseball does that yeah. they do post-game suspensions football did yeah. they did like the um sue when he stepped on that guy they did all that after the game because the the, the umps didn't or the refs didn't see it as clearly yeah but that that play. was it that was a truly egregious you know example yeah i I, I'm a I'm a big fan of expanding after the fact, yeah, video review for things that are impactful enough that you would suspend a player. Oh, yeah. For example, what do you like, think about that uh, in terms of golf, Mark? Because I know PGA just made that rule where, like, hey, fans can't call in to to assess a penalty on a player because they saw the ball move or or, or what have you. Yeah. What's your opinion on that? So that's an interesting one. And I'm I'm not 100% I don't 100% know if I'm caught up on golf. I'm much more invested in, in disc golf discussions right now in terms of uh the rules cuz there have been situations where that's happening and I'm glad if they ban fans from being able to call stuff in that that's clearly the case. The interesting thing with golf and disc golf is that they are self-refereed sports. In all these other sports we're talking about, there are referees and umpires watching everything that happens. Even at the highest level of golf, there's not someone watching every shot. They certainly call them over a lot. There are officials on the course, and they'll be you know nearby, and you can call them over. Um, and it's gotten to the point where, you know, because so much money's at stake, that players routinely call them over whenever they're you know, they, they've hit into a hazard or something just to make sure they did the drop correctly, which a lot of people complain about, but I don't know if there's a solution to that just because of the, the amount of money at stake there. And I think that's actually a great part of those games, though, is that they are built upon this tradition of self-refereeing and therefore self-accountability and accountability of others between the players. So, yeah, I like the idea of not allowing fans to call something in. And I would not support post-instituted penalties like we're talking about in these other games unless or actually in any of these sports unless it reaches the level of infraction that is a suspension worthy thing or fine worthy thing i don't know what that would be in golf right you don't it's not a contact sport so there's not like these instances where someone is deliberately like assaulting another person but i guess you have i don't know there was a situation with Patrick Reed, where it was caught on tape that he was he was improving his lie. And that's a big thing in golf. And it was in a bunker. And he was clearly, during these practice swings, pushing sand away from behind his ball uh, to improve his lie. You know, that's getting close. You, you could argue that, yeah, maybe he was doing it unintentionally. and Or maybe it's, it's ambiguous enough where you don't know if he was doing it intentionally that you don't actually suspend or fine him or something but you can imagine something where it's just completely obvious that someone is attempting to cheat where that would be the case but i think yeah i think for any post-game penalty it's got to be the type of penalty penalty that results in suspension or fine for it to be uh, assessed after the fact the interesting thing golf is pretty straightforward in terms of how it's regulated disc golf is much more fascinating because there are tons of minor infractions that happen pretty much every round that people don't call as a matter of culture. And I kind of think it's a good thing. So in disc golf, there's a rule about where you're 
where your foot can be when you throw the disc. So it's trying to it's trying to replicate golf where in golf you just the ball is there and you hit it where it was. In disc golf, you're not hitting anything, you're throwing something. So it, what's regulated is that your foot has to be in a space immediately behind where your previous disc landed. And there's some wiggle room. It's roughly the size of a sheet of paper that your space is. It's like 20 by 30 centimeters, I think. And you can't go past, you can't have a point of contact past that space when you release the disc. And there's other rules. The foot has to be on the ground. But you watch any professional round and someone's getting close at some point or maybe barely misses it or is a little too far back. And it's pretty much agreed upon, even on the professional level, that unless it's egregious, they're like three feet away from their their mark, or it's clear that they're doing it to gain an angle advantage, uh, no one's going to call it at all. That I think I'm okay with. It's fine. Maybe there are better solutions, but in the grand scheme of things, it's hard to be that precise, and it's a matter of like inches and millimeters and except in certain contexts, it's not a big deal. It doesn't affect, right? Disc golf is not a game of, of centimeters. It's a game of like feet. The other thing though is with that's been the big controversy in disc golf is timing. You have 30 seconds to throw your disc once it's your turn to throw. And I think the rule, the new rule is the area is free of distractions. And there are a couple of players on the pro tour who are notorious for consistently going past those 30 seconds. And I think what disc golf is doing is all right in that they are allowing officials to give people warnings and then in give people penalties if they're notified about it. Uh, because the, the problem is that this one pro in particular who's known for this is also known for being incredibly moody one might say or passive aggressive and so if he is called out on something it can actually affect your own play because now he's just being whiny the entire rest of the round and so there's this idea you don't want to call people because it like brings down the 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 morale of the card and so i think this semi-solution of having it where officials can be given a report or a tip and then discreetly time people and then give them like i think two warnings and then a penalty stroke i think that's all right as a solution for the for those games uh even if it's technically not the cards strictly policing themselves anyways that's the stuff going on in disc golf and golf yeah it's almost closer to board gaming than uh any of the other sports things that we've been talking about you know there's there's more of a social contract of how how you play play the game yeah. Do you agree with that? Yeah. And I think largely in those games, it works. I think the social contract or as they call it, unwritten rules stuff in baseball is a bunch of silly nonsense. But in golf, you know, it, it's largely in support of an idea of fair play. It's very Rawlsian. So there's this political theorist. Named we all Rawls. know exactly Rawls. what you mean. Do you? <laughs> I think the more interesting discussion is what do you do if you suspect someone of cheating in a board game <laughs> but you, you don't know for sure oh I just point out oh I think you missed that rule or something in that situation you assume that they you know you assume ignorance rather than malice right until they show otherwise but yeah I think in golf and disc golf it's Rawls so there's John Rawls is a political theorist who had this idea of fairness it, there's a test called the veil of ignorance. So the veil of ignorance is you assume assume that you could be any member of the affected group. So in political theory, you could be literally anyone in the country and you use that as a test to measure whether or not a certain policy is fair or not, is that you eliminate your own like personal standing. You could be literally anyone else. And so I think golf and disc golf kind of self-regulate along those lines of you don't call really minute ticky tack stuff because you wouldn't want it called on you in any situation and you wouldn't want it you wouldn't want the the sport to be the kind of sport where that thing is used to try to gain a competitive advantage so that kind of right. mutual understanding i think it's healthy yeah the baseball I'm just stuff having, is dumb 
I'm just having extremely strong flashbacks to college intramural ultimate frisbee. Yeah, ultimate frisbee is the same way I think in some leagues. I think there might be an ultimate frisbee league that actually has referees. I actually re- um, remember that. I think the two major leagues. That's one of the major differences. One is so yeah refereed, and the other has. has. But but yeah, right. The the idea that the game that you're playing, you you wouldn't want the rules enforcement to be something that would make an experience that you don't want to have. Yeah. Even if it, if it's affecting someone else. Yeah. And I think, I, I, I think that, I think that is a really good that really principle. Well. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because this, it applies to sports more in the kind of casual to semi pro range. I, I almost feel like there's a dis- distinction between, you know, me playing sports, which is casual all the way up to, like disc golf, but not the the absolute highest level of disc golf. Perhaps feels like one category. It, 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 something something about like the highest level of sport being like all or nothing is appealing to me. I, I see this in actually I see this in competitive magic, where you know there are all these ethical gray areas that sometimes get discussed. And there's kind of an understanding that at high level tournament magic, everyone is playing to to the full extent allowed by the rules. And and that's the understanding. So that is the social contract. Um, And and I like that for that that single instance. But all the players that would play in that high level tournament would also admit that 90% of the magic they play there's more reasonable wiggle room for mm-hmm. for what is acceptable behavior yeah. in, in that sort of thing. Yeah. And I don't think that doesn't exist in golf or disc golf cuz the the foot fault penalty is a thing where yeah, there are borderline cases, right? And and you don't have like you'd literally have to like pull out a ruler to try to get some of these things. There's also something about a game where you're playing for score rather than playing a zero sum head to head thing that I think uh, accommodates that while still maintaining super high competitive levels of play. The timing thing, I think, you know, the slu- having a solution to that is fine. The footfall thing baked into the rules is that benefit of the doubt always goes in favor of the player. So in my mind, it's kind of using that, it's kind of utilizing that rule in a, in a positive way. Um, and I think that's good for the sport. Uh, but I, I do agree with you. Like, like we were talking about before, like strategically, you know, anything that's legal should be allowed. And so if there was a disc golfer that made it his mission that he wanted to change the culture to, to call things more frequently, I kind of wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't mind that, right? As long as they were, you know, consistent about it. It's an interesting thing. Uh, there's one other rule in disc golf that I want to get to before we run out of time, and that is dealing with this idea of randomness in sports. And I think it illustrates a really fascinating conflict where we want sports to be about people being excellent at what they do, but we also want sports to be highly random because randomness is exciting. And I think the two-meter rule in disc golf is a really, really interesting test case for that conflict. So here's the two meter rule. It is an optional rule at any given tournament. It's basically only used in California. And even then, not always in California. And it is, the the rule says that if you throw a disc and it gets stuck up in a tree and that it's more than two meters off the ground, you take a penalty stroke. Otherwise, uh, you would just play from directly underneath where the disc is. And so the argument is that whether or not a disc hitting a tree stays in the tree or not is highly random, and therefore you shouldn't penalize it if it does stay in the tree. And then the argument against is that, you know, be that as it may, higher skilled players don't go into trees as often, right? They go around the trees. So there's all kinds of fascinating discussions around it. I don't know what you guys think about this. I'm have, curious. Have you, um, have you watched coverage this week at all of yes. the OTB? Yeah. It's it's in play at that tournament for, I think, 
four holes or something like that. Yeah, I saw it's, that. That's really it's weird. Only a, it's only a subset of holes. But be that as it may, like I, I actually really like it, specifically at this tournament um, and specifically at uh, on, on most holes. My argument would be if, if you're throwing a shot that doesn't require you to go up and over trees, you might as well have two two meter in play. The crazy thing is, though, that in California, a lot of those courses do require you to go over trees, and and that's where I don't like. The it. Like, th- there's there's one hole, there's one hole on uh, is it De La Viega? Yeah, that we're yeah. talking about. You're literally that, throwing over trees, and like not not only are you throwing over the trees, there's one hole on that course that you're like coming down into trees, and you physically have to throw your disc through a down through a tree yeah like just hope that it lands on the ground yeah uh, that that's, that's kind of bad. foolish to me yeah yeah but like if you're just on, on the course that they're doing this weekend there's there there are shots where they're throwing high but it's a choice like mm-hmm. they're deciding yeah. to do that uh, so, so every so every that... single hole has the ability to go low so, so the question is, do you want to more incentivize or less incentivize those sorts of shots in general? Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, if you have the ability to go low, then I think it's a fine rule. I think trees are so important to disc golf. I think long term, it disincentivizes courses from using trees. Right. I like the idea of certain holes. You'll have trees very close to the target. I think if there were specific courses that were designed for the two meter rule, that would be great. Um, where there were legitimate choices being posed to you of this route is risky because it goes near a tree and it's narrow and you try not to get into the tree or you can take this other route. That's maybe not as advantageous, but it, it avoids the tree, right? I think of courses, if you had in an alternate reality where the two meter rule never became optional is always in play. And that started being a design consideration and the game was built around that. I think it'd be great. It'd be fine. It, it feels like output randomness, which we, we typically don't like in, in, in game. That's what I'm saying. It, if it was a matter not, of input randomness, I think it works. If it's yeah. a matter of output randomness, it's not right. I think that's a yeah. really good way of, of phrasing it. Right. And so there's courses or, holes that specifically you have to throw near trees which in a lot of places like up here in new england that's how it is you're always throwing near trees now fortunately the trees in new england are often very bare or sparse at you know for the first 10 to 20 feet they're not big bushy trees uh but different areas of the country you do have big bushy trees in the deep south um texas was weird it had all these little short trees when i was when i was disc golfing down there in south texas uh, California is a mix of trees that eat discs or trees that, you know, are mostly trunks. Uh, so I think, I think for disc golf courses right now, it's, it's just, it's, it's fine to have it as an optional rule. Um, I think the player should always have the opportunity to climb the tree and throw tree. from the tree. <laughs> <laughs> I love I, it. I saw a post on, on disc golf, uh, the disc golf subreddit where someone did that. <laughs> They were they were hanging by one arm, uh, and had their foot up behind the disc in the tree and threw with the other arm. <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting. I, I like the input versus output. Yeah, if it changes your decision making in a legitimate way, I think it could be really interesting. But given that disc yeah. golf is still like we're just getting to the point now where there are actually courses like deliberately being crafted and not like scrappily thrown together on the cheap in, in public parks. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it works. Another way of saying it may is that maybe in what, twenty years, say, maybe in twenty years, the the two meter rule makes a whole lot more sense. Yeah, is there? Can you think of a corollary in real golf? Here's an interesting one: bunker sand. So there were there were pros actually complaining this weekend at the PGA Championship that the bunker sand wasn't con- as consistent, and they deliberately use coarser sand. Uh, there was a course at one of the big tournaments last year, or maybe the year before, uh, where they did not have rakes in certain sand uh, areas. They had like waste areas that were a big part of the course, and they had some bunkers that did have rakes, but a lot of it were waste areas. Uh, and you were encouraged just to kind of smooth it out with your foot, but you didn't rake it. 
And I think those complaints are silly because the sand used in bunkers and the way bunkers are expected to be maintained, to be put back to these very smooth surfaces, means that in many cases in golf, you are fine going into a bunker. And the entire point of a bunker is that you shouldn't be fine. (laughs) The point of a bunker is that it's a hazard and that going into it should be a penalty. But for most of the pro tour, 90% of the time, the person would much rather be in a bunker than in the rough or Mm -hmm. even in certain lies on the fairway near the green uh, because you can generate a lot more consistent distance control and more spin out of the bunker than you can from even the fairway. So the idea of deliberately having bunker areas that aren't as pristine um, in order to increase the risk of the ball being in a really bad lie in that bunker, I think is actually good. But I think it's good because it does penalize somewhat arbitrarily, but it's specifically a thing that's supposed to be a penalty. And it encourages a greater skill set in practicing tricky bunker lies. So players who are have practiced and who are more skilled at getting out of buried or uneven or awkward angled lies are going to have better outcomes and their skill will be rewarded. For the two meter rule, it's just you get a penalty if you're unlucky. You get a one shot penalty. There's no right, additional. Right. You're still taking the next shot from the same spot either way. You're not. You're only penalized for the bad luck. You don't have a chance to recover from it. So I think there's some parallels, but there are some differences, which is why I would kind of go for the more random. I like I like the more random bunkers, but I generally dislike the two meter rule i think randomness in sports is is fascinating to think about but let's talk about our final point of discussion here which is robots robots playing all our sports (laughs) (laughs) to be fair there is a robot sport uh, what's it called battle bots battle bots man that was fun for a while it's still going it's still thriving is it yeah so gil hova board game designer is a massive battle bots fan and uh, he'll occasionally talk about it or tweet about it. He follows all the narratives, uh, all is the meta. On, is it still on like Discovery Channel or whatnot? I don't know. I don't actually know. It's on Tech Tech TV. Wow, which was not Tech TV for long, if I remember correctly. <laughs> uh, but anyways, introducing robots. What are what are some of the areas where this is being considered? Obviously, the strike zone in baseball is a, is probably the most prominent one. I don't know if yeah. any other sports have have automation or the, the, there's the uh, general there's, there's goal line technology. Yeah, that's oh, that's yeah. the big one I I was thinking of. Does does hockey implement that in some way? No, hockey is utterly inept at anything tracking. They have video <laughs> replay though, right? Yeah, but that's different. They can and yeah. honestly they can still screw that up because the hockey puck goes so fast. Yeah, they should do that in hockey. I was watching cricket the other day. I was in an Indian restaurant, and they had cricket on. Cricket's great with it. If the wicket gets knocked off, a light flashes, right? There's a light attached to it. And they do video replay in like 10 seconds. They literally, they call for it. It gets displayed on the jumbo board at the stadium. The refs are looking at the jumbo board, and then... Someone behind the scenes makes the call and displays what the call is on the board. And it yeah. all happens in like I 10 think, to 20 seconds. It's amazing. I think one of the most distressing part of the robo umpire discussion in American sports is it. There, it's always pitting like the integrity of, of the human element against this impersonal force. It's like, it doesn't have to be that at all. Why can't it be umpires working in conjunction with technology to foster the best possible sporting experience, which is what I think you just described about cr- cricket, which I'd never heard of before. Wait, you've um, never heard of cricket or you've never heard of um, <laughs> I've never heard of, <laughs> of uh, replay in cricket. Yeah. yeah. It was really cool to see. So two things. One, I wanted to mention the other place that it's being considered is uh, uh, the chain gang, first downs. Um, oh, 
Yeah. That'd be good. That's, that's another the chain. One. The chain game is the most arcane, like <laughs> al- alchemy based. It's so true thing in the in modern life it's, so... <laughs> it's like a winnowing rod two guys come out <laughs> it is yeah and it's known to have a significant home field advantage right i actually i don't know that i've never i've never I don't know if that's that. statistically known if that's something i've just heard murmurs about or speculation about I'm pretty sure the NFL hires unbiased people, like actual referees, to do the chains. Like they do that in in high school football. Okay. Like I could I could go apply to be chain gang for my local local yeah. high school or something like that. Yeah, having a literal chain determine something as minute as the placement of the ball, which is already like guesstimated by the ref, oh. right? Well, then that's the other thing that that's the other thing that's been proposed is we, we've got these sensors in the football. Why not use that for spotting the ball now, too? In football, those are the two big robo things that are being. I mean, the, the ref could just have a little beeper that says further up, further up. Further up. <laughs> um, but how much more satisfying if if the technology was integrated seamless to where it wasn't a distraction. It's just you get exactly what the player did. You get exactly the output of 22 players crashing against each other. You see that output and you you move forward. Yeah. And, and like that's such a more satisfying narrative, I think. I think I think it actually enhances the 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 integrity of what the players are doing. I don't know. I think there's a certain point where it might become too sterile and I don't know how much of this argument I'm about to make I actually believe. There's something really entertaining about all of the meta argumentation in sports. (laughs) Right? Like there are certain things, yeah, where I was on the fence a while about the strike zone in baseball. I'm fully in line with robo umps. Although an alternative of umpires actually being penalized if they suck or being sent back (laughs) for training or not be given home plate assignments if they're objectively bad, I would be all right with also. I I think there's something interesting about pitchers and batters learning the tendencies, you know, the really borderline tendencies of an umpire, I think is kind of interesting. But at a certain point, I don't think that's egregious. interesting at all. I, I I don't think there's anything interesting about that. But I, think I don't if think you, that kind if of you want that, thing is allowed by the umpires union, and I don't think that'll ever become a thing. Uh, so I'm fully on board with robocalls. Yeah, but I mean the drama of, of <laughs> people arguing with the umpires is kind of part of the entertainment in many of these sports. <laughs> To a certain degree, it's a very like American thing. I think <laughs> it it certainly detracts from it in the sense of it being a game. But yeah. as entertainment, you probably have a point. That said, I'm willing to embrace any and all automation until just to see if we ever hit the point or it becomes too sterile. Because uh, I so, think we're, we're on the too too uh, messy side right now, so I'm fully on board with making yeah. it less and less messy, and then and seeing what happens. Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, there are interesting stories. I, I'm not as big a baseball guy as you guys are, but you know, there, there's a catcher out there, maybe St. Louis is that that that's known for framing. So basically, oh, yeah. manipula- ma- manipulating the re- the refs to call more strikes. Yadier Molina, uh, my favorite player. There, He's the ball. There is some, something interesting in that, but uh, honestly, I I find it more interesting to know which pitcher legitimately threw more skillfully, you know. Although it's, I know they've been testing this out in the minor leagues and a lot of players really hate it because the and you'll see this 
you'll see this if you watch games because they all have the tracker and they show it on the screen. They superimpose it on the screen of what whatever system they're using. I don't know if it's the same system that the that the league uses in the minor league testing, which ones would be called balls and strikes. And sometimes there's a strike right on the corner that everyone watching, playing, the announcers know, quote unquote, is a ball. But according to the robot, it was a strike. Yeah. And so I don't know what you do. Do you make the corners rounded? Like there's got to be some kind of fine tuning to match expectations, which are slightly different than the technical rule of where the strike zones should be. There's something I think there. you can you can realign the expectations in a couple of years. That's true. Or there'll just be a lot of entertaining bickering in the meantime. No, I disagree with that. I don't think you can. And the main reason for that is you cannot realign expectations at the little league level. And that's where everybody yeah, that, loses the game. That, that's a good point. Yeah. And, and that's a good point for, for all these. Th- this is the reason that you couldn't do continuously varying sports <laughs> in basketball. Because it would be t- too expensive for Little League. <laughs> that's the only reason that it, it won't happen. <laughs> Oh man! Uh, I also just one more thing on Robo. I'm st- I cannot stand when the catcher sets up on the inside corner and the ball goes to the outside corner and it's in the strike zone. Oh, but like the catcher it. moved all the way across the plate. I'm sorry, that's a ball, even if it's in the strike zone. Whoa! Okay, yeah, because yeah, you should mention that's a ball. You, you are an actual baseball umpire. Yes. Wait, you call that a ball? It's absolutely a ball. You got to hit your spot. What? You got to hit your spot. You don't think the strike zone is an objective area? It's absolutely not. Huh. Yeah. So are it, you yeah. in favor and of it, Robo? It, um, also, also it gets it gets bigger 3 and 0. Oh. The strike zone gets bigger 3 and 0. Oh. And, and and this is this is more those unwritten rule things. Um I would uh, replace you with a robot in <laughs> No time flat. <laughs> I am. I am more. I am not in favor of robo-umps. I will say that, huh. but it's more to do with the little league argument. Yeah, I don't do not think players could adequately adjust from when you play See? as young boys and men to going to robo-umps. I but think. it. And to me, that's similar to the the previous conversation about kind of that very top tier being held to different standard or, 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 you know, completely playing within the rules to their fullest. I don't buy it that professional athletes can't adjust. If it was implemented at the college in entirely the minor league system that players couldn't adjust by the time they get out to majors, like D1 college and all the minors. Maybe, maybe it would just. It would take a very long time. You know what else I think would happen? Catching would change entirely. Hmm. And you'd see zero stolen bases, which I do not like. Wait, what do you mean by that? Right now, catchers have adopted the stance where they are on one knee. Okay. To catch, to, to help frame the pitch. And to be fair, they do change that when there's a runner on base. But you can do all sorts of things where... There's no umpire behind you anymore calling pitches. You don't have to get out of his way to have him see the baseball. You can just stand behind the batter or get in a a sideways position that benefits you, Hmm. helps you to have a better pop time, if you will. And I don't think that that's been taken advantage of at all in the minor leagues. But you, if you implement robo umps, you're not going to have somebody back there that you need to think about. That's I tell a when, really when I, compelling argument, actually. When, when I when I umpire myself, I'm talking to the catcher all the time. Like, hey, you you can't stand up. I'm gonna miss the pitch. Huh. That this happens. So catchers do have to adjust a little bit. It's not a ton, but all the 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 traditions of how a catcher sets up is because they have umpires behind them that have to see the pitch. From someone who doesn't really care about baseball that much, <laughs> like th- th- these whole tradition things about that, the interaction between catcher and umpire and batter just sound like complete garbage. You know, it's just, 
it's completely uninteresting. <laughs> like, <laughs> there, like, it, I, I understand why it's interesting, but I have no interest in investing in that at all. I don't know. Like, for the for the health of baseball, is it? Would it be better to ditch those for something that feels more absolute? I I do think robo-umps would help viewership, uh, as in like the viewership experience. Yeah, um, I I agree with that. I just think they will have lasting side effects that are not good for the game. Because stolen bases are already on the decline, like just because it's statistical. Them. What's that? <laughs> I love stolen bases. Oh, I think they're really cool. And I think, you know, the statistics are pretty strong that they're rarely, they're, they're, they're certainly not as, as good as of a strategy move as people thought in the 70s and 80s, when, which was the last peak of, of stolen bases in, the, in Major League Baseball. Uh, but I do think having it as an option and having it be somewhat regular is good for the game. I just don't know how you make that happen. He, hear me out on this one, too. Strikes one and two with nobody on base. Why do you need a catcher? <laughs> Put the catcher at, at in the infield. <laughs> with, two, with two strikes, he can go back behind the plate. <laughs> it just it opens up weird rules that yeah. like there's not a rule that there's not a rule saying a catcher has to line up behind the plate. Is there? There there is a rule saying the only person allowed to be in foul territory is the catcher, but it doesn't mandate that he has to be in oh. foul territory. If he's catching, he has to be in the catcher's box. Yeah. I, I'm, I don't think there's a mandate in the well, rule book. I mean, says there should be a rule that the catcher. catcher has to be in the catcher's box. Then I'll throw <laughs> this one out though, because I know it's being discussed and it absolutely makes no sense to me. What do you think about the shift or banning the shift rather? I, I don't think I want to see it banned, but I want to see teams get better at beating it, man. It's that taking, is entirely my argument. It, okay, it's so for those far too long. For those who don't know uh, or don't watch baseball, the shift is when if a batter is known to routinely hit the ball to one side of the field, which a lot of batters do, they hit to the kind of the inside part of the field from where they're standing. Uh, they'll move the defense over to cover that space with more people, um, often leaving massive empty spaces to the opposite side. And that's called the shift. And there's apparently talk of banning the shift, which to me is absolutely insane because it's very simple to get a hit if they're instituting a very dramatic shift on you. And, and I think the only thing stopping players from more routinely beating the shift by just Dinging the ball to the other side of the field is pride. It's because no one knows how to bunt anymore. <laughs> it's pride. They can clearly practice bunting. How long is it going to take a professional athlete to get good enough at bunting to beat the shift 50% of the time? A couple weeks? Like, it's literally pride. And so players and coaches are choosing to lobby for this rule to ban a strategy because they don't want to just suck it up and hit to the other side of the field. I, I think that's an absolutely ridiculous thing. Cause the thing is, once you start beating it, then it happens less. And then you get what you want. Anyways, there was apparently some analytics work done on it two years ago that did actually support some of the bigger players, not trying to beat the shift as in like, Hey, Hey, swing hard you're gonna hit a double or a homer we don't care about singles type thing sure um but but if that's, uh, that, can, if that's that cannot be true can't be yeah, true that for cannot players. be true for every player though uh, it, especially it, now that the ball's dead yeah and if it is true then great like what are you complaining about <laughs> right that's like, true yeah yeah it's yeah anyways to wrap this up i think there are lots of fascinating game design things in sports and I think the incentives at play, again, are really fascinating in terms of what is what feels fair to the players, what embraces tradition, what are they expecting from the game, to what drives viewership and money being spent and excitement, which is what the owners want, to 
what is actually an interesting game in the long run to things like safety, comfort, a perception of the sport having integrity or having like clout like in the culture. All of these things factor into these discussions about rules and sports and most of them are not things that you would consider in other kinds of games that don't have tons of money and attention behind them, but it adds another dynamic. I'll throw it out there. I still have the game idea to turn this into a game that's semi-cooperative where each player takes a different level of management. So someone rep- someone is playing as the players uh, who generally want to perform well and get paid. And then you have someone who's the coach, someone who's the ownership and Often, you know, if 90% of the time their incentives align and it's a cooperative game, but 10% of the time uh, you may have conflicts of interest, I think that could be a really interesting board game Uh, because all this I find uh, the expansion could have the city, like, yeah, the local governments or the U.S. government, like, Congress has hearings about sports stuff, uh, which I mean, I think is ridiculous, but that shows the level of care. Is it basically? Isn't uh, Major League Baseball exempt from Monopoly or whatever that's called? Oh, yeah. I think there are there is a special law for that. Yeah. Oh, actually, Amber was working with someone. She had some lawyer thing that was tangentially had some kind of tangential relationship to this with baseball. I forget what it was. Golf's a nonprofit. PGA. Really? Yeah. They've donated like a billion and a half dollars to charity since they're founding yeah the government gets involved that's a weird relationship especially local governments right like the the question yeah. of using eminent domain for baseball or or for sports stadiums is yeah. fascinating i think clearly wrong but all kinds of things at play in sports so i think even if you're not interested in sports generally i think as a game design from a game design perspective, there are interesting things here, and maybe uh, you would enjoy watching sports, especially Cardinals baseball. Nah, <laughs> Braves. They just won the World Series. If you need, if you need a team, they're under five hundred this season. That's say, okay. Aren't they not doing well <laughs> this season? <laughs> they're in a really tough division this season. Yeah, Is the, both was... with the Mets and the Phillies are both really good, also. Phillies aren't good. Phillies aren't? But the, the, the Mets are good. The Mets are really good, yeah. Still waiting for the Pirates to get relegated. I was going to say, yeah, the Cardinals are playing the Pirates uh, the last couple of games, and the Pirates have been very kind. They've done their job by losing spectacularly. I was watching the game the other day, and they said that in the last 30 games between the Pirates and the Cardinals in Pittsburgh, the Cardinals are 25-5. and five. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's disgusting. So Pirates are doing their job, just giving wins over to the Cardinals. Love to see it. If you have any sports-related rules or anything related to what we're talking about today that you think is, are fascinating, maybe with some sports that we're not as familiar with. There uh, have to be really there's interesting. There's got to be stuff in every sport. Every sport. Stuff right? in, in lesser-known sports. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because at a certain point, right, it gets really competitive and lots of money gets uh, becomes a factor, and that just makes all of these conflicts more spicy. Uh, so if you know of any, uh, leave a comment. I, I would love to hear about it. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll have a sequel episode to this uh, and talk about some less familiar sports and whatever rule stuff they got going on. Like cornhole. Yeah, like professional cornhole broadcasted occasionally on ESPN. It's true. (laughs) Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, If you'd like to see everything I do, go to thethoughtfulgamer.com. If you want to support the podcast, go to to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. I just got a new patron today. Super exciting. It's been a while. Uh, You can find me on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you would be so kind to leave a review and rating for this podcast on your podcast source of choice then that would be cool please do that i think i got it all i think i got every single one i did unless i forgot it so hard that i really forgot it rather than just temporarily forgetting it like i usually do i'll find out later anyways thanks for listening everybody goodbye <laughs>